Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope y'all are well. Um, glad y'all could make it. Uh, Lindsay and I just finished our exam like two hours ago, so <laughs> we are half alive right now. Um, as I mentioned on the sign up, uh, we obviously didn't have time to prep anything for this, but um, we'll just kind of walk through some, kind of like we did for neuro, like we'll walk through some of the high yield points. Obviously, if y'all have any questions, we could try to go through those. We'll make this uh, a team effort on everybody's part and Hopefully some learning will be done. If y'all are curious, um, the term five exam, we thought it was gonna be much worse than it was. So that's good for y'all going forward. Um, there was a lot of, a lot of uh, drugs uh, that we were worried about, but it ended up being fair. So um, no complaints there. Um, as for your guys' exam, uh, the, those little bit that I remember, I remember coming away with basically this, right? I really enjoyed Dr. Rayner's lectures. I thought she, she's brilliant. She knows how to teach. I left that exam thinking, I can't believe her questions were so hard on this test. Like I felt like I understood the skin stuff and I, her questions were just uh, really hard. So that being said, uh, make sure you understand uh, all that micro. This is like your first introduction to micro. It just gets, it just gets worse. It's kind of one of those things um, like, you know, I, I like to do the whole, like, if you understand it, you don't have to memorize it, you're good to go. Micro is one of those things you kind of have to sit with a list and memorize it. Uh, oh, sometimes yeah. there's no rhyme rhyme to, you know, no reason reasoning uh, with it. You just have to memorize it. So, um, mm -hmm. but y'all y'all got that with the parasites and all that in term three, too. So, um, so don't sleep on that, um, on the, uh, the, the skin stuff, you know. Um, Lindsay, you have any advice before we get started? I do. Um, year two is very different from year one and how I studied. And it took me FTM, FTCM to figure it out. And I regret that. Um, with the pathology, pathology is actually probably going to be the easiest of everything. The micro in the farm is definitely going to kick you up, down, sideways. Um, with the farm, when you're going through chunk all of the diseases together so it's very organized the lectures are very organized in that it goes step by step this is what you're doing this lecture this is what you're doing this lecture and it will go disease by disease by disease my best piece of advice is to chunk those diseases and then you need to know what the presentation is, but the presentation is just how you're going to be able to recognize the disease. Everything else is the testable stuff. So if there's a gene or if there is something special about it, that's what they're actually going to test you on. But like when it talks about the symptoms, put that into your own little vignette and know that that's how you're going to recognize what you're talking about, what they're talking about. And then you can figure everything else out. But it's a it's different it's different from how you did it in term in year one it's a lot different and i i think y'all could have noticed by now um so the pathology department went through uh a huge they, they redid all their lectures so you could see that uh they're very dense but they're very comprehensive so you unless you really like love boards and pathology and going you know like you can learn a lot just from the SGU lectures like everything you need is there it's very well described and it's almost like reading a textbook like a chapter of a textbook right um but i like lindsay was saying the pathology thus far has been pretty straightforward i mean some of the renal stuff was difficult but um like as in like it, they give you the presentation um and it was fairly straightforward but um as for the micro, it's just a lot. And then when y'all get to farm a little later on, um, it's a good bit too. But as of right now, what y'all need to focus on. So what we'll do is I'll just kind of pull up some of the lectures and we'll go through. This is informal. I don't have the chat up. So y'all just need to um, speak up if y'all want to say something or if y'all have any questions or anything like that. All right. So um, these lectures... These lectures here are not tested. Um, I'm not sure if y'all know this. These lectures are not tested on um, your exams. These are for the OSCE. So you can put these aside for now. You'll get, we kind of like when these come up because it means we have less lectures to do. We just sit through in class and, and listen and don't have to worry about this to the OSCE. Um, so um, 
that's good. So then some of these DLAs that y'all did in the very beginning were um, all review, right? So good review to go through. You will have some questions on it. I wanna say this. Um, I remember Dr. Dasso having, I think it was, it was an IMCQ and a specific question set where the, the math problems went from like one to a hundred, right? Like there was one set that was like straightforward, like term one. And then there was another set and like an IMCQ that you did that was just like, you needed like three or four equations. And like, it was stressing me out for the test, like having to, you know, sit down and work through all that. Um, but on the exam, um, on the exam, actually it was the, 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 the math questions were very straightforward, like for half-lives straightforward type stuff. So a lot of those ones, so, so what I'm saying is don't spend a lot of time going through those, those that crazy set, uh, that crazy IMCQ and that crazy um, um, Sakai set that he did because uh, the questions will not be that bad. Granted, maybe it's just because they made them easier because we don't have whiteboards right now, but regardless, they weren't, they weren't that bad. Okay, so you had the pharmacodynamics, pharmacokinetics. Um, I always jump to first aid to look at this stuff, but this is all pretty much review um, for you guys. Then y'all did clinical farm, same stuff. Yeah, volume distribution, first order. Obviously, it's important to know this. Um, I think a lot of the FTCM is preparing you for the modules ahead, like a lot of the neoplasia lectures. Like it's review, it's, it, 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 but it's important that you know it because uh, they're not going to teach it again in the next couple modules when you get into like actual uh, chemotherapy regimens and stuff like that. Um, let's see. And then y'all had another one. Again, these aren't tested right now, so y'all don't need to worry about stuff like this, right? So you'll get love roadmaps by the time y'all are done with this. Um, so all this was pretty much straightforward uh, review. I remember they did teach, I swear in term one, they said dysplasia was irreversible. But um, it act, it's to, a, to a certain point, it is reversible. Um, I came across that, yeah. So just keep that in mind. Um, yeah, so one of, I mean, one of the big things with um, cell injury is any damage to the mitochondria, any damage to the cell membrane is irreversible. Other than that, you could kind of deal with it, right? So um, I remember they did have questions like that, um, fairly straightforward. Yeah, see any sort These of- These lessons are very straightforward. The, the neoplasms, everything kind of at the beginning of FTCM, that's not path micro or um, farm or straight path. It's very straightforward and it incorporates into everything you do. So for example, everything related to neoplasms, everything related to um, cellular injury, it comes back in term four and term five. Um, but with respect to these lectures in and of themselves, very straightforward, understand what they're talking about, understand the definitions um, and you should be good. Right, and so you should remember some of this stuff from term one, I suppose. Uh, cytochrome C, obviously, once it's gone, that is a signal for apoptosis. Stuff like reperfusion injury, obviously, the more time, say, the brain is ischemic, uh, once you get that blood flow, you have a lot of factors that come into play. Um, so these reactive oxygen species. So this is one of the high top the topics that they like to discuss. But again, anytime you're talking about cell injury and stuff, um, damage to the membrane is terminal, right? Can't do anything about it. Um, and mitochondrial damage, calcium influx, stuff like that um, are, are permanent or, or, you know, destroy the cell. Um, this is more definitions, target effects, drug development. I don't know that we have any questions on this. Maybe just the, did they do, oh yeah, right. So the phases of drug trials. Yeah, sure. You definitely should know that. Um, knowing which ones do what, but that was a term three thing that y'all did too. So ANS, right. Um, just don't skip over this stuff though, right? Cause like, this is like that table from first aid. Uh, you need to know this and you know this by now because this is gonna come into play when y'all talk about um, uh, all those drugs or y'all already have talked about them. Um, sorry, we're like going on like very little sleep. <laughs> we're gonna do our best here. Okay, let me pull, let me actually open this one and see. Neurons are not firing at yeah. maximum capacity right now, guys. Uh, I'm very delirious, so um, mm -hmm. I may just laugh at myself. 
All right. So, right. Um, M2 is primarily on the heart. That's a, an important thing to, to know because when you talk about the baroreceptor reflex, super important, there'll be 10 or so questions in regards to the baroreceptor reflex. Um, I, on, um, I like to draw these out when I do these problems, like I do all three lines, um, just because it's quick, you can go do, 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 and then you know that you're going from bottom to the top, like Dr. Coley says, or did he not teach all this? I don't think he taught y'all. He taught us, he taught us this. And he would say bottom to the top, right? So you could figure out uh, how the bear receptor is going to fire in each regard. There were questions on the exam that literally had these graphs like this. So um, you kind of you can determine what um, what's going on. Right, uh, M three right on the vessels, endothelium specifically. That's important. Um, yeah, again, we're talking about the parasympathetic system, the cholinergic. Um, the muscarinics, right? Um, okay, and then add, obviously if you add atropine to it, you're going to be able to affect that baroreceptor response. Um, I think there's slides on, on it coming up. We can't disable the weighting, nope. Okay, people are still coming in. All right, so, right. So obviously atropine will block your parasympathetics. Um, right, so a big thing, uh, with atropine is if you block parasympathetics or you block the M receptors, you won't get sweating. Um, that's a big thing in these tests because um, when you think of a sympathetic overdrive, you kind of think of sweat, but you have to remember that's that one exception on the sweat glands where even though it's a sympathetic, it's sympathetically driven, um, it's a muscarinic receptor. So the patients won't sweat. Okay, so you'll come across questions specifically that'll say that and you'll need to be able to identify um, it's not a sympathetic, uh, it's not a sympathetic overdose as much as it is an, as an anti-muscarinic, right? Because if you have a sympathetic overdose, you will get sweating, you will get that muscarinic response. But if you're looking at an anti-cholinergic or anti-muscarinic, um, you, you know, you're going to get sympathetic symptoms or blunting of parasympathetics, but you also lose the sweat as well. Um, why do I put this here? I don't know. All right, and yeah, so we're just in implementing atropine to the effect, right? So, okay. Um, and obviously if you have any questions or something to say, I'm more than welcome to, we're just kind of walking through this. I think once we get to the atro, I mean, the um, epinephrine and stuff, it gets a little bit more uh, important. Of course, nicotine and it's say it has a flipped response. So where you'll get um, at low doses, you get uh, a positive, like a forward flow of sympathetics or a ganglion re ganglionic response, but at high doses, it reverses and it's ganglion blocker. That might be more of what we're doing now when we talk about the, the toxicities. I don't know, don't know if y'all actually got to that. So this should all be fairly much, this should be a lot of review from um, uh, term one. Um, yeah, and again, so yeah, organophosphates, remember that aging process, if, if, it, if the organophosphate hasn't gone through the aging process, you could use parathione. Um, wait, no, is that the drug? No, it starts with a P though, anybody? The, the P drug? You Probably use? doxine. That's it, yes. If, the, if, the, if it hasn't gone through the aging process, you could use that um, along with, um, uh, what do you give? To atropine. Atropine. atropine right yeah right okay right so yeah so right so you get the dumbbells response you get a parasympathetic response so you want to give atropine to block that right exactly thank you um okay then no let's see mm. right and these are all just mo mostly just uh definitions they really didn't get into the quaternary i know there was like tertiary versus quaternary i remember like trying to commit those to memory, but those didn't come up. There it is, paradoxical, if aging hasn't occurred, yeah. So, right, okay. Let's see. Okay, again, this is more review, definitions type, irreversible cell injury, right? Uh, make sure you know these definitions. Um, they all indicate if you're breaking the cell down or the nucleus down, you're gonna get um, irreversible injury, but yeah, as with these definitions are important. Pygnosis is shrinking, 
karyohexis is breaking it up and karyolysis is when it keep, it completely breaks up. You can't see it anymore. Um, of course, necrosis versus apoptosis. Remember, apoptosis is a program. It's, there's thought that was put into it. Necrosis, just, you're just blowing everything up. There's not a lot that goes into it. The one I always would get confused is the membrane blabbing. That seems like a necrotic process to me, like the membrane falling away, but it, it is apoptosis. So membrane bleb, blabbing um, is an apoptotic process. Uh, it's, it's, it's a thought, thought that went into it, right? You can see that, those blebs there. Um, again, but this is more... This is more review, but we should go through this because um, this comes up again. I had, a, so, I had a question. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, if it says um, mitochondrial swelling, but it doesn't specify like, amor like amorphous bodies, is that still considered irreversible? Like any mitochondrial damage? Because like there's a question where it was like, so all, like reversible is the, like the ribosome detachment from the ER and also the polysomal detachment. And then I think it was comparing like, what else would you see? Like, what's the difference? Yeah, I, I was somebody like, was, could, was, yeah. Somebody could correct me if I'm wrong. I think swelling in general is is reversible. Um, it's once you like once you break through that cell, uh, the cell wall, that the cell membrane or the mitochondrial membrane, uh, then you actually get a reversible injury. Um, I, I believe swelling is still considered um, reversible to a degree. Okay, yeah. so they have to specify if there's like the the calcium deposits in there. Or yeah, those, exactly. Like, like that's. Yeah, you're done if that happens, right? Exactly. That's that usually that reperfusion injury, like the cell's like starving because it doesn't have anything around, and all of a sudden it's like flooded with all this salt and all kind of stuff, and it just um, it's just too much to handle. Um, right. Okay. Okay. So any sort of solid organ is going to go under go undergo coagulative necrosis, right? Coagulation. Um, so you um, so you can see that here, this pale infarct. Um, and you can see it, this is, this is a solid organ, right? So like versus the brain, for instance. And then you could determine it if this, there, it's pale versus if it has a dark structure by, by uh, the amount of, um, the, the amount of uh, accessory blood that gets to it, anastomoses, right? So things like the lung has, have a lot of extra uh, blood that can get there um, from different areas, but things like the heart specifically, I know they have a picture of it, of, of the heart uh, will show um, sort of like this pale infarct here that you can see. Um, but um, uh, it, it would indicate that there's not a lot of uh, accessory blood that goes on to, uh, that goes around it. And then liquefactive necrosis is pretty much specified to the brain. Um, I think that's the only place we really see this. But of course, if there's pus formation, anytime you have pus, that means there's neutrophils involved. Fat ne necrosis, fatty, uh, yeah, pancreatitis, that's your keyword for that. Um, that would come up uh, with um, pancreatitis. Uh, caseous necrosis um, indicates usually, yeah, usually it's a cheese like, if that's the caseous structure that they talk about. And you're talking about um, like granulomas, right? So, like the, the tuber tuberculosis granulomas is caseous, because what you're going to find a lot of times when you start talking about um, lung pathology, they'll say non-caseating granuloma, and that indicates there's no tuberculosis there. So caseating usually re uh, refers to uh, tuberculosis, right? All right, and you can see that here, this cheese-like structure. Um, fibrinoid necrosis, blood vessels, fibrin, right? I don't know if y'all talked about it when y'all talked about the hyaline membranes um, or the hyaline arteriosclerosis, um, but uh, that happens as well. So malignant hypertension means it happened immediately, right? So like within a day, your blood pressure started going to like 200 over 110. And then you get this, um, this fibrinoid necrosis. If you have long standing um, hypertension, you get hyaline arterial sclerosis. I'll probably cover this. If not, y'all do it in renal. And then uh, obviously I'll know what this is, gangrene. Uh, dry versus, versus wet. Um, yeah, but again, yeah. So like, these are good. You need to get the definitions down now because um, they're just going to throw it in and you're just, or you're going to have to, you're going to have to know it already when you start looking at the different pathologies of the heart and the kidney and stuff like that, the spleen. Um, okay. There was another one on this. Okay. I guess these are the antagonists, atropine. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. This was like a weird thing. Um, shoot. It was like low dose atropine works in reverse because it prevents the release. Does anybody remember? I can't quite. So it acts on like an inhibitory releasing M2 receptor. So it blocks 
um, additional release, I believe, and that's why you have the bradycardia. Okay, yeah, that's right, and it does. It's it's very counterintuitive, right? You like you release atropine, right? Uh, so you should uh, have tachycardia, right? Or you should inhibit the bradycardia, but it depends on where it binds to. So it's just it's not exactly intuitive uh, with that, right? So this would be more of what you would expect: the tachycardia once it binds uh, postsynaptically, but it has an inhibitory process presynaptically. And then similarly, when we get to epinephrine too, there's basal levels versus high dose levels. Okay, so all right, of course, any sort of cholinergic agonist. Um, Organophosphate poisoning, you want to get the hatropine, um, which used quite often. And you can see this here, um, right? All of these parasympathetic muscarinic responses. Scopolamine, uh, yeah, I mean, that's from motion sickness. It has an anesthetic effect as well um, at high doses. And then, oh man, see, these were tough. You need to take your time and go through these and just make sure you understand them because. Um, like it's different. You need to be able to differentiate madriasis versus cycloplegia and the, you know, the, the, the lens, um, you know, the shape of the lens as well, because I'll show you, I think it's at the end of this lecture. Um, he goes into, let's see. Um, see like this would like, if I would look at this, I would just literally memorize these two go alpha one. I mean, y'all, this is more of like a, your one thing to show the term ones, but y'all get this by now. Like there's not a lot, you know, you don't have to go through and memorize all this. You just have to memorize the little exceptions here, right? Two things and everything else falls under M3, right? Heart's always M2. Okay. Um, yeah, y'all know how all that works. Okay, I guess it was in another lecture. Hold on, it must've been on there. And then all of these pathologies, right? So you should look forward to these. Um, these will be easy points on the test. I think the farm, and then when you get to the micro, that's gonna be the more difficult part. Um, again, this is all review. They did ask us questions about this actually, what goes with what? I think y'all had probably had practice questions with this too. Um, the rolling versus adhesion, or if you have a mutation in one of these, um, what goes on? Mm -hmm. Again, uh, this is more clinical reasoning. So read over it if you want, save it for the OSCE. You can deal with it later. All right, here we go. So this is when we probably talk about epinephrine. Right, okay. So you have basal levels of epinephrine flowing in your body right now. They're low levels of epinephrine that causes vasodilation. It's very important to understand the difference here, right? Because when you're running from a bear, you get surges of epinephrine and that's where you get the fight or flight response. That's where you get vasoconstriction. So on the exam, they have to specify um, when you give epinephrine, if it's in the answer choices or if it's in the stem, it, they have to specify if it's low dose or high dose because of this uh, response, at least if they're talking about uh, the vasculature. Um, Again, see, we're looking at that atropine. That's that weird thing it does, that low-dose atropine. Right. So remember, epinephrine works on all four um, alphas, two alphas and two betas, and then um, norepinephrine doesn't have a beta-2 effect. And it is important. I mean, I know Dr. Kolias didn't teach all this, but he... I'm, I'm assuming he wrote our questions for our exam. I'm not sure if y'all would get the same questions, but like he would ask us certain things, like the things in first aid in the beta two section at the end that you like don't look at, like like the insulin secretion stuff like that. Um, he would ask about. So um, make sure you know all the responses for all the different um, uh, receptors. Right. So these are great. You should be able to be able to do these. Um, and be able to map the, or map it out, yeah, the mean arterial pressure, right? Um, just to kind of see uh, that these are good too. So in, in it, adding on to where I what I was saying, I used to draw these out when I would do the questions or whatever, or the practice questions, um, I would do these two, right? So bottom to top, once you do peripheral resistance and you figure out the map, um, so for this one, it stays, since the systolic goes up and diastolic go down, the mean stays pretty much the same. Um, and then you could dictate the heart rate based on that. Okay. Um, so there we're using low versus uh, the high dose. 
Um, again, norepinephrine. So whereas epinephrine low dose will have a beta-2 response, norepinephrine doesn't work on beta-2. So it'll, um, it'll give you a complete vasoconstriction. Alpha-1 effect. Remember beta-1, one, one heart, beta-2, two, two lungs. So that beta-1 effect is always going to cause tachycardia. Um, these are super important. These slides, I put a star on it. You need to understand both ways. If we're stimulating the parasympathetics, what is going to be that M2 response of the baroreceptors versus inhibiting it and um, being able to determine, or actually, well, it goes both ways, right? Because um, these are these are the baroreceptors, but yeah. So, um, but that M2 response to block it. So that's a good example that they could use. They could say you gave a drug and then you gave atropine with it. Um, what is the uh, what is the, the consequence there? So if you're blocking, if you're using atropine to block it, you're going to block those M2 receptors, the heart rate. Right. Again, you can see the difference here. Um, uh, the mean arterial pressure went up a little bit with norepinephrine, which you would expect the blood pressure to go up, both systolic and diastolic. And then, since you get um, a higher peripheral resistance, that'll give, cause that reflex bradycardia. The baroreceptors, the response will go down. Dopamine's a little weird. Um, when I think of dopamine, I think of the kidneys because um, it has the, that effect of renal blood flow. That's what I think about. So, um, whenever you have a patient, um, that's a low GFR or kidney failure or whatnot, um, you can think about one of these dopamine analogs. Right, of course, again, this is, um, this is from term one type stuff, just as long as you have a good definition for it, you should be able to work these, these questions out. The more practice questions you get, the faster you get at it. So that's, uh, it, you know, if we all had all day to take these exams, it wouldn't be so bad. It's a, just a time constraint. Um, Right, isoproteranol, it's a, yeah, right, beta agonist equal. Oh, by the way, um, I thought, let me just show y'all a trick. Um, so I think I mentioned this previously, this is for the beta blockers. A through M are selective, right? So atenolol, selective, yeah. Uh, atenolol, metoprolol, they're selective beta one versus beta two. N through Z, like propranolol, are not. So they have an equal response uh, on it. What's interesting is that like in real life, that, like this, even though it's selective, like it may be 60% selective for beta one and 40% selective for beta two. Um, so you still really don't want to give it in real life, you know, because even though it's selective, it still has uh, that opposite effect as well. So. Um, and I think Dr. Coliath had mentioned stuff like that too. It's like, you're not just, you know, so um, just be aware of that. Um, but yeah, I think that's from first aid. A through M is selective, N through Z is not. Okay, again, I would draw these out, make sure you understand at least the peripheral resistance and the heart rate, right? They should be um, opposite in most cases. So butamine really are, you only really give this when you're in heart failure. Um, yeah. Um, I could post all my lecture notes for you guys too, if y'all want, um, since I have all these, all this stuff highlighted, um, all the, <laughs> my, my neurotic highlighting, the red's really important, green's kind of a little less important and yellow's extra stuff, but I could, I could, I could post all this for y'all if y'all want to take a look. But yeah, okay, phenylephrine alpha one, right. Of course, brings up your blood pressure, you'll get reflex bradycardia. Mm, clonidine's blood pressure medication, but it's centrally acting, so it makes you kind of slower. You know, it helps with anxiety even too. Um, Methadopus for pregnancy. It's the eye stuff that gets tricky. Um, I'm gonna get to it at some point uh, at the end of one of these lectures. It goes through the eye. Let's see. All right. Um, I guess it's it's got to be the next one then. All right. Again, they're just really just easing y'all into this whole pathology thing. A lot of basic definition. Um, so take advantage of that. Those questions in, um, in Robbins, I didn't do all of them. I only did the ones that were assigned, but I thought they were very representative of the test questions. If there's a picture uh, in one of those assigned questions, it may be good to look at it. Not that you, uh, not that you necessarily can, only answer the question with the picture, but it'll definitely help. And if they chose questions with a specific picture, they probably did it for a reason. 
Um, this is this will be more helpful when y'all get to the kidney stuff. Um, but uh, with all the glomerular diseases, okay, let's see, this must be the one. All right, so now we're looking at the blockers. Um, right, so yeah, this should, I mean, if you just sit down with it for a little while, it's kind of just all starts to make sense. Like, um, besides some of those weird things like the atropine on presynaptically, like why does that work for epinephrine low dose versus high dose? Like, oh, other than that, like this, this makes sense by, by the definition, right? Oh, here you go. Halal A through M selected. Pendulol, which one? Because um, I, that's, yeah. So like they would, they would, he would ask stuff about these, like this one, like I, I guess I just didn't want to learn the I stuff or I was like, it's really confusing me, but they came up. So make sure you don't sleep on those. Right, so here we go. Yeah, this is it. So, yeah, so this would make sense, medriasis versus meiosis. Um, but when you talk, start talking about the ciliary muscles and stuff, uh, like it is strictly governed by the muscarinic receptor, right? So it has a parasympathetic component to it. So like, well, I guess I'll go on through some of the practice questions. Wait, it should come up here. So this makes sense, right? Alpha one dilate, parasympathetics constrict, that's fine. Um, but when you talk about stuff like, wait, no, that's the same thing. Um, when they start talking about cycloplegia and relaxation and accommodation, like it's only, is it only the, mm, sorry, I had a point to be made. Mm. Like when you talk about accommodation, like you're, you're talking about the muscarinic response. I, I, I think I'm right about that. Like, so when you're talking about pupillary dilation or constriction, um, you can have both a sympathetic and a parasympathetic response. But then when you talk about long distance or cycloplegia, um, it's pretty much all, all a um, parasympathetic response. I thought there was more to that, but sorry. Hey Brady, I had a question. Yeah, for sure. Um, this, I mean, this might be a little extra, but you know, they, they I mean, they taught us bromonidine um, for alpha two. And then they didn't ever give us mechanism of action for the eye for that. Um, they just said it's an alpha yeah. two. I don't think alpha two deals with the eye at all. It's more of a central, right. central acting thing. So like clonidine or like there's mirtazapine, which is a, a antidepressant, but it's all centrally acting. Um, I don't think, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think uh, we look at uh, alpha two in regards to the eye. Yeah, we got we got it for uh, like I think it was part of the DLA, you know, read on read on your own time type of situation. It decreases aqueous humor. That's all I know. Okay. And it's an alpha two agonist, but I just could not for the life of me get the MOA for it. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, if it decreases the aqueous humor flow, it's going to prevent production of it, which will decrease the pressure in the eye, which will um, decrease the glaucoma condition. Okay, so medically, yeah, that would, I guess that would be, that would be the, the um, reason to use it. But in regards to like actually um, dictating like um, your, your ability to see, uh, I, don't, I don't think it comes into play as much. Um, but yeah, so like, okay, so like I was saying the dilator versus constrictor makes sense alpha versus uh, muscarinic, but then when you talk about the ciliary muscle, like adapting to short or long range, it's all of a parasympathetic response. Um, y'all probably came across questions, if y'all know what I'm talking about, um, where they, they block um, one of these versus the other. And, you know, sometimes this will come into play if it's parasympathetic and sometimes it won't. Um, I guess I'd have to see one of the questions. Yeah, but I'm sorry, don't sleep on the glaucoma stuff with the intraocular pressure because that's super important clinically as well. But yeah, like pilocarpine is given. Um, all right, so I like Dr. Gatos. He's very uh, comprehensive with his stuff, but it takes a little while to get through. But after it's done, um, 
you kind of understand it. We put a lot of time into this work. Right, so you need to be able to differentiate COX-1 versus COX-2. They're kind of, even though they go sort of through the same pathway, um, they're very different in their side effect profile. Um, right, so super important to remember COX-1, uh, typically when you talk about ibuprofen and stuff like that, um, uh, or aspirin and whatnot, um, well, aspirin's both, but the ones that are primarily COX-1 um, are gonna affect the gastric epithelium. Why is that? Because they tend to block prostaglandins. Prostaglandins have a protective effect on the, um, on the mucosa, right? So if you're blocking prostaglandins, you can get ulcerations. Whereas COX-2 uh, tends to work more on the heart or it tends to have side effects on the heart, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, yeah, well, no. Um, right. So of course, if they, they'll give you straightforward questions, they'll be like, the patient has a lot of, uh, uh, um, uh, gastric ulcers and stuff like that. So you want to put them on more of a COX-2 selective, right? Um, so like celecoxib is the main one that they, they talk about. Um, but the most of the ones, the over-counter ones that you see are going to fall on this one, ibuprofen, aspirin, is non-selective. Right, and it's important to understand like all of the effects of prostaglandin that, that fall under. So like a big one is that prostaglandins keep the afferent arterial, uh, well, prostaglandins themselves, let's back up. Okay, so prostaglandins will, uh, will cause vasodilation and they will cause, um, uh, they will not cause, well, they will not cause um, like platelet adhesion, right? They will, they will inhibit platelet adhesion. Right, so that's the exact opposite of thromboxane. Thromboxane will cause vasoconstriction and will cause platelet aggregation. So you can think of them as opposites. So you need to keep a balance when you're talking about it um, because if you inhibit prostaglandins too much, you can have uh, certain side effects such as if you, since prostaglandins vasodilate, if you block them, you can get vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole. That's important because it'll decrease your GFR. This is why you have to be careful when you give uh, kidney patients or renal failure patients, um, uh, NSAIDs, right? Because if you, if you block prostaglandins and you constrict the afferent arterial, you're going to decrease your GFR. And if the GFR is already low, that could cause a lot of problems. For most people, it's not that big of a deal if you de de decrease their G GFR a little bit. Um, but if they're already in renal failure, that's a problem. All right. So what are the, some things you can give? Misoprostol kind of helps the help with the mucosa, PPIs, yeah, um, obviously, and histamine blockers. So, yeah, probably probably good to know this. Um, right, so of course, if we're talking about gastric problems, the ones that are more COX-1 selective versus COX-2 at the top, and when we talk about the cardiovascular side effects, this table will be flipped. All right, so, and again, so this is what I was talking about, this balance between prostaglandins or prostacyclins um, and thromboxane, right? So we're talking about um, the differences there. And so you can see this is flipped for cardiovascular risk. So they will straight up tell you on the test, the patient has, has CHF or whatever. And um, so you don't want them on a COX-2, right? You want to put them on a COX-1. Um, obviously, if you're, if you're wanting to prevent um, any sort of, uh, platelet adhesion, so you're trying to prevent any sort of emboli or strokes or myocardial infarction, you put them on low-dose aspirin, because at low doses, the aspirin will block thromboxane, will block that platelet adhesion, but it will not uh, cause too many side effects because it's uh, it's low dose. Right. I have a small question, actually. Yeah, sure. Not that big of a question, but like they classify the NSAIDs into either non-selective or COX-2 selective. So is there uh, a COX-1 specific for any of the non-selectives or no i don't kind of apply to both or is it like I a ratio kind of like yeah i don't think so but when i think of these non-selective ones i think of more of a cox one effect because like with the ibuprofen and endomethacin and stuff like, like you get a lot of gastric ulcerations so maybe it's, this cox one is a little more selective but like um if they talk i guess you could think of it like this if they talk about heart problems, you want to stay away from this. If they talk about gastric problems, you want to move towards this. Like maybe these are non-selective in a sense, but like you, in this regard, you would think of them as having that, that, um, that COX-1 effect. 
uh, at least over these, right? So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, um, I, I I can't say for sure, but I know that even though they're non-selective, they do cause a lot of gastric issues. It has to okay, do with yeah, that. I still see them with Pox one, but also like I was never really explicitly told that like they have like they're directly only Cox one, so that's why I've never. Uh, yeah, it may be it, it may be like those beta those beta those um, beta agonists that are selective, and it's like sixty forty. You know what I mean? It's like you still don't want to give them if it's forty, right? It's sort of like that. that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. All right, you know, by now endomethacin will close this because prostaglandins uh, will keep it open and endomethacin being inset will decrease prostaglandins. That's why it closes the ductus arteriosus. Right. Um, yeah, and you can see a direct correlation, right? So, well, not, you know what I mean? Um, so versus COX-1 versus COX-2, uh, it's proportional. So it's very straightforward, whatever, risk factor that they give you for the patient, just use the other one. Meloxicam is not over the counter. That's prescription, yeah. Um, yeah, and so this is what I was saying, right? So prostaglandins in and, in and of themselves cause vasodilation. It's very specific in the kidney to this afferent arterial. So don't make too much of this, all this nonsense. All they're saying, is that if you block prostaglandins with an inset, you're gonna cause constriction of the afferent arterial. If you constrict that, constrict that, you're not getting enough, a lot of blood to the glomerulus, so you're gonna decrease your GFR. Now in a healthy patient, that doesn't really matter, but you have to be careful for kidney failure patients, right? As you can see. Right, so that's what he was getting at here, of course. Don't want to use opioids or even train them at all if you don't have to. Watch their liver function with acetaminophen. Um, yeah. Let's see. Leukotrienes, when I think of those, I think of the lungs, right? We're going over to the lung side. Um, obviously, they have more to it than that, but I just think of them because of the, um, um, the leukotriene inhibitors for, for asthma. All right, and then celecoxib, be careful, even though um, they say they want to stay away from a COX-1, you can't use those because it has, it's, it's a sulfur drug. All right, oh Lord, what happened here? ACE inhibitors, mm. oh yeah, it blocks bradykinin, so you have to go this way. Um, I don't know, I don't remember. <laughs> oh, like, oh, oh, this is the three drug combo, the triple merit went, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So you never want to, these, this came up on the test too. Yeah. So you never want to give these, this is like a bad combination. ACE inhibitor um, will cause efferent vasodilation. Um, NSAIDs will cause afferent. Uh, so basically on the front end, you got very small vessels. Whoops. What's going on? Hold on. On the front, no, hold on one second. On the front end, you have very small vessels. You have a kidney. On the back end, you have a very large vessel. This will very drastically decrease your GFR. Why is this not working? I, don't know. I think people are still joining in, so it's like, all right. So this will drastically decrease your GFR. Right, because uh, can't get blood in, and there's no, you know, it's it, it's not it's not pooling here either. It's it's easily getting out. So that's bad for the efferent. That's bad for the inferent, e, for the afferent, and also you're decreasing the amount of blood in their body, <laughs> decreasing the fluid. So yeah, um, you're literally going to, you know, decrease their uh, GFR big time. So yep, definitely don't do that. All right, yeah. Mm. Yeah, right, I mean, that makes sense, right? So if you already have some sort of inset damage to the cosa, it, corticosteroids were gonna block your inflammatory process. So that'll make it even worse. You can't fight it off. Warfarin, you can't coagulate. Yep. Bray syndrome always comes up. Don't give aspirin to your kids, right? They'll always say, had a previous viral illness. Um, so yeah, make sure you give them acetaminophen. What is Ray syndrome called? Is it kidney and 
kidney and liver issues. I forget. Does anybody know? Somebody can look it up and throw it in the chat. I think it's liver and kidney uh, problems, just in case that comes up. All right. Um, and aspirin, of course, is irreversible. You know that it'll block both. So it depends on the dosage you want to use for it. Um, yeah. Okay. So it is one of those mixed acidosis. Um, so there's no compensation because you get, so you will get respiratory, wait, first of all, you get metabolic acidosis because it is an acid and you're ingesting an acid, which means you get respiratory alkalosis, which means it causes you to hyperventilate. Those two processes happen independently. That's why it's mixed. Okay. So the fact that you ingest it causes a metabolic acidosis on its own because you're taking in so much acid. The fact uh, that it blocks the chemoreceptors in the brain causing, oh, it doesn't block it, it, it activates them, causing you to hyperventilate, getting rid of carbon dioxide. So you get a respiratory alkalosis. Those are two independent processes. So there's no compensation, um, but they, ha they happen uh, on their own. So be careful of that. Right, low dose, low dose uh, aspirin will work on thromboxane. Uh, of course, it's irreversible. What does that mean? That means until you actually make new platelets, where, however long it takes, a day or whatever, um, these platelets will never work again. They're irreversible. They die off because they're inhibited, um, which is why you could take low-dose aspirin once a day because it takes a whole day for you to make new platelets, right? And it's, it's not until those new platelets come around that the thromboxane will be activated. Um, Oh, it says seven to 10 days. Well, you still take it daily doses, but you, you get what I'm saying, right? The whole point is you um, you have to keep making new platelets for them to work. Right, important. Um, this should make sense, right? Low dose, you're blocking thromboxanes primarily. Um, and then uh, medium doses, you're worried about more of the inflammatory process versus the platelet process. So think of that low doses, you're getting into people, people that have pre previous MI, stuff like that. Conventional, you're just trying to get rid of the inflammation. You like, so this is like 81 milligrams versus like 300 or 400. And then COX inhibitors is more about that inflammation as well. Yeah. Um, right, so, and of course, aspirin, ethanol, phenytoin always go through zero order connect. What does that mean? That means there is a constant amount that is gotten rid of, so, uh, that you get rid of, that you metabolize uh, over time, right? So you uh, may metabolize three milligrams of it an hour versus um, first order kinetics, where it's a percentage, you'll metabolize 50% of it uh, an hour, right? So if you're in zero order kinetics, it's very easy to overdose on it because you're not getting rid of a percentage basis based on the amount you have. You're just getting rid of a little bit at a time. Uh, a milligram amount, so you can overdose on it uh, easily. Right. Like I said, I'm gonna post these for you guys, so y'all y'all can at least look at if y'all want to look at what I felt was um, important. Yeah. So yeah, it displaces uric acid. It does like two ways. Yeah. There's oh man. Right. So there's a way where you get hyperuricemia and hyper. Yeah, you'll have to just go through these, but you definitely want to know both of these. Like, depending on the transport it's used, uh, it'll displace. Does anybody want to explain this? Anti oat. Why'd I put that? Okay, so it's going to hold on to uric acid. It'll reduce yeah, it's the, uric acid. the oat versus the rat. Um, it's based off of the dosage, regardless of how much aspirin you give. That's why you typically forget you wouldn't give aspirin. Even in low dosage, um, it's going to hold on with, I think, oat. And then for the rat, if you give high levels yeah. of aspirin, it's going to do the opposite. So it's going to like, one way or another, you just don't try to give aspirin for oat or the goat. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, right. So with the oat, hyperuricemia, so you're displacing it, keeping, as, uh, keeping uric acid in your blood. And then for the urat. Uh, you're actually displacing it and you're getting more uric acid in the urine. Neither one is good, obviously, um, but um, I guess clinically, yeah, if you need, yeah, you would do some, you would use allopurinol. You wouldn't want to go through this route or anything like that, right? And this is this intoxication I was talking about. 
um, remember, it's, it's, there's, this is not a compensatory process. There are two independent problems that's happening simultaneously. So it's a mixed acidosis, or it, sorry, it's a mixed um, uh, problem. Mixed acidosis alkalosis. Um, right, acetaminophen. So now we're moving away from kidney problems to worrying about liver problems. Um, uh, acetaminophen will help with pyretics, so like um, with fever and stuff like that, but it's not going to really have anti-inflammatory effect. That's why it's not classified as an NSAID by itself. Um, yeah, and analgesic effects as well, but no anti-inflammatory antiplatelets. If you ever see, yeah, it's what they have in Grenada. That's actually acetaminophen. Right, so of course, you definitely don't, if a kid comes in with fever or even pain or something like that, or inflammation, you wanna stay away from aspirin because of Bray's syndrome. Uh, go ahead and just give them acetaminophen. Right, the antidote in acetylcysteine, right? For acetaminophen overdose in acetylcysteine. But no, yeah. All right, so yeah, so that's important. Definitely need to know that stuff because um, you're gonna deal with it in practice. Uh, every day. All right, so granulomas, ulcerations. So I, I y'all have probably, y'all have done a couple of these pathology where you write your own questions now too. I actually found those like, found those good. It was like, like if I did a question on it, like I, uh, or I explained it in group, like I felt like I knew it pretty well. I think my friends agreed to, we would do practice questions, be like, oh no, I presented on this. So um, take advantage of that. Like, um, you could definitely, I mean, you have to be there anyway, right? So you might as well uh, try to learn from it. But again, this is, you're still getting into the, uh, they're still outlining like how this whole pathology thing's gonna go because it gets heavy next when y'all do cardio and renal. Okay, all right, opioids. Right, so it's good. It's good to go through these. Um, I think Dr. Gatos does a really good job uh, explaining the different receptors. Let me just point this out. This is super important. Um, so anyone with psychiatric problems, you want to avoid any sort of opioid that um, affects the kappa receptor. Okay. Um, and I think like other than that, it's really not too much of a problem. Like you're going to get respiratory depression, um, with, you know, with the mu receptors, constipation as well. But these psychiatric symptoms, that's an easy test question to get. You got to stay away from those. All right. Um, right, which is very, it's like, it is um, interesting in that there's not only a ascending pathway to tell the brain that you're in pain, but there's also this descending pathway where serotonin and norepinephrine are actually used to kind of signal to like stop the pain as well. Like, I don't think that's very intuitive, but um, if you go through these, uh, um, you can actually see how the, uh, if you block these GABA receptors, so the GABA receptors are gonna block the release of like right here of serotonin. Therefore, that's gonna be an, uh, an upstroke in pain or it's gonna signal pain. But if you could go, go ahead and block these GABA receptors, then this serotonin can be released and if that's the case, you could help numb the pain or block the pain signal as well. Um, so yeah, if you just go through these, um, uh, you can kind of work out how it works. And then once you have the, the process down, you can go uh, through and see how some of these drugs work. So yeah, um, right. So let's take example, these kappas, right? So these PBN, what did he say? Oh yeah, this group, this mixed group, they only have PBs and Ns. None of the other ones have PBs and Ns in the other groups. I think that's why I wrote that there. Um, but if you had to give a mixed one um, and there was some sort of psychiatric problems, uh, you would want to give buprenorphine, buprenorphine, buprenorphine uh, versus these because you don't want to exacerbate any psychiatric symptoms. All right, but the ones we typically think about are like these. Um, the primary receptor we talk about is the mu receptor. Um, so you could see that here. Right. Um, yeah, good to know these, of course. Um, 
the different uh, cautions you need to take. The main thing you're going to get with opioid overdose is respiratory depression. What does that mean? What does that mean for their metabolic state? If you're holding on to carbon dioxide, you're holding on to the acid, which means you get respiratory acidosis. Okay, so if they talk about that with some sort of overdose, um, it could be um, it could be an opioid. Serotonin syndrome, right? Anything that has to do with um, increasing the amount of serotonin, all of these SSRIs are first line. We just did this on our exam. TCAs have so many side effects. MAO inhibitors aren't used as much anymore either. Um, but anytime, you never wanna combine these, at least in a, in a vignette, right? Maybe in real life, they figure out dosages, but in a vignette, you never wanna combine these um, uh, because you get this serotonin syndrome. Uh, and you can see here, even blocking these, uh, using opioids, so it doesn't even seem like it would deal with that in that regard, but these are very important because they help to block the GABA receptor, therefore uh, the serotonin is able to be released, and if that's the case. Um, am I backwards? Does the serotonin block the GABA? Mm, why does it look like that? No. This is going this way, right? Yeah, I think so. Regardless, uh, these medications, because they help to uh, upregulate serotonin to help with the um, analgesic process, they can, if you're already taking some sort of serotonergic drug, it can make, it can, you can cause serotonin syndrome. Of course, opioids do work on the um, dopamine pathway, the, what's it called? You know what I mean, in the brain. Um, I forget, but you know, the dopamine pathway, that means they have an addictive quality to the nucleus accumbens. Yeah, that's it. Uh, all right. And when you look at, when you look at the scaling system for pain management, it's like zero to three, four to six, seven to 10. Uh, the way I do it, so it's not opioids first. So things like aspirin, um, you know, NSAIDs, the four to six, you want to give oral opioids. Um, so things like, um, um, what do you call it? Like hydrocodone. Hydrocodone are the yeah, ones yeah. that they listed. Yeah, these, right? These down here, hydrocodone, oxycodone, those are all tablets. When you get these, the seven to 10, these are all, um, these are all IV medications. Okay, so you could break it up that way. If you just remember which ones are IV versus oral, that splits the group and the second and third. Heroin, uh, I think the neat thing you need to know about heroin is that, uh, what do you give? It starts with an M. Um, yeah, the clinics. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so tired. Uh, what's it called? Do you give heroin overdose? Uh, it's not overdose, but addiction. Maybe y'all didn't cover that yet. Methadone? Methadone, that's it, right. So methadone has a slower act action than heroin. So whereas heroin spikes up and down, um, methadone keeps it at a baseline so you don't get those highs and lows, but you don't actually go through withdrawals. So it's not a perfect system, but um, it's a means to not using heroin. Meperidine is typically a problem for healthcare people that have access to it. Um, just keep in mind it has anti-muscarinic effects, right? Which makes sense here, hydriasis uh, and tachycardia. Uh, it's not super important. Fentanyl, very potent. Um, oh, there's methadone, right? Uh, this is it, yes, okay, great. So yeah, you see the methadone kind of keeps you stable uh, throughout the day. Um, you're still getting uh, an analgesic effect, but you're not getting these rapid doses, you know, these ups and downs, kind of staying stable. Again, it's not, I mean, you're still, yeah, I get it. There's political concerns going on with that, but um, at least people aren't out on the streets using heroin. All right, of course, yeah. Um, is this why, yeah, you don't give Cody or you don't give opioids in general to children. I don't think unless you really have to, they're not coding uh, because they're wrapped in metabolizers. Um, but obviously you can give them like sickle cell patients, you can give morphine and stuff too. I guess this is specific for coding. Right, and again, the one one thing, yeah, that's important to point out, no kappas for any sort of 
psychiatric issues. You have to be careful with that. Right, report buprenorphine is a partial agonist. So um, it can also be used. I think they use it in conjunction with methadone because it's a partial. Don't quote me on that, but I think it is part of the regimen. Then of course, naloxone, if you've ever seen that or in movies or whatever, uh, some, somebody overdoses on heroin and they just shoot this Narcan up their nose and it, like they completely come out of it. It's, it's insane actually. Um, and they're all pissed off because they're not high anymore. Um, and then now Trexone is more of a longer acting to kind of stay away from it and stop the cravings as much. Um, but that, that, you know, the patient has to be um, uh, compliant with that. Tramadol is a partial or weak agonist, um, front moderate pain. So uh, if you don't want to give complete uh, like um, hydrocodone and stuff like that, you can give tramadol. Codeine, of course, is used with cough medicine as well. Uh, loperamide comes up a lot. I don't remember why. Well, it is one of those ones with the serotonin syndrome. I think it's safe is why. Oh, yeah. Limited access to the brain, low potential for abuse. Yeah. So, um, so keep that in mind. <clears throat> All right. Good. Let's see. I won't go through all these. This is more just definitions. Um, now osteoarthritis, again, you're just trying to help with the pain. You can't really do much about it. Um, yeah, I mean, you could, could give them steroids. Again, that's to help with it. It, it doesn't, it's not really an inflammatory process though, like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, this is more inflammatory. These are gonna be important because you do look at some of these anti-TNF drugs, these uh, monoclonal antibodies and stuff. And that's gonna help uh, decrease that immune response to everything. So def definitely go through these. Um, yeah, and like I highlighted that, like that's the standard treatment. If you're gonna go through the combination therapy, methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, and sulfa yeah. Migraine, same thing. Um, I think you use serotonin. Mm. Yeah. Uh, mm. There was like one migraine one that's low. Sumotriptan, that's the one that works yeah. on the agonist on serotonin. Yeah, that was an important one. So just don't sleep on these uh, DLAs. These are important gout. Of course, you want to use uh, what you call it, allopurinol. Stop that process. That's the big one, but I think we did have questions about these other ones. Probenicid used often. Well, these urat transporters come up again. Um, all right. Let's see, more still like we're still going through definitions and stuff. So this is just the healing. If you didn't learn this in term one, good to know, but these are still a lot of definitions involved. Scarring, normal scarring, um, contained, they say contained within the wound versus if it goes outside beyond the boundaries of the original wound, that's the keloid. Uh, right, oh, there was this picture. No, this picture, take a screenshot of this picture. This came up on our test or practice questions. It definitely came up. Um, but yeah, this is the calcium deposits. Uh, which is weird, wait, it is calcium, yeah, it is calcium. It's weird because the serum calcium is still normal. So it's dystrophic calcification. Oops, let's see. Okay, immunopharmacology, what was this? Oh, oh yeah, immune medication. They didn't really dive too deep into this because it's very complicated to be honest. Um, but if you have a, diff, if a good definition for like what these drugs do, even if you don't completely understand it, like dacrolimus is primarily used to keep your T cells uh, at bay. Um, the lab values will come back fairly normal, but they'll prevent your T cells from spiking. So it prevents um, transplant rejection, stuff like that. Um, yeah, knowing like these little details right here. But as for like sitting here and like walking through this, like I don't think that's necessary. Just as long as you kind of just regurgitate what the drug does, you should be fine. Um, I didn't. I don't remember that being too terribly difficult. 
like a, as in it's a very difficult concept immunosuppression versus like what they test on wasn't that wasn't that bad i don't know why this isn't highlighted must be an old copy um right so yeah I, okay i don't know what happened um yeah, so just the concept TNF alpha, right? Tumor necrosis factor that's going to initiate a lot of inflammatory process processes. Um, so if you could block that, uh, you can help with uh, in, inflammation. So yes, these are these are like I'm sure y'all y'all have probably seen the commercials for these infliximab, etanercept. Those come on uh, TV uh, commercials, so they're they're commonly used. This one too as a commercial. Um, but yeah, like what I have highlighted is basically all I knew about it, right? Which is binds the RGE. That's fine. We'll be fine knowing that, right? Maybe CD20, so B cells. Of course, these are B cell problems. But don't spend too much time, right? So yeah, these are all different. These are important to know, which goes with which. I think it was first aid might have a way to remember these. Okay, um, amyloidosis. Yeah, so I remember this lecture. Yeah, uh, there was a table, I believe. So it's amyloid and then something, which dictates. Yeah, there was a bunch of tables. So you need to know these tables, right? So light so chains inside and out. Yeah, everything will come from these tables. So light chain meaning there's yeah. some sort of immunoglobulin problem that's causing this. Um, AA tends to be rheumatoid arthritis or chronic inflammation, right, inflammatory system. Renal failure, this pops up in dialysis. Yeah, these microglobulins. Um, but yeah, the, unfortunately, you just kind of have to commit these to memory. Alzheimer's, these are those uh, plaques that, those, that forms, those neuritic plaques that form in the brain. Um, so yeah, but you could probably get the answer to the question just by being able to recognize what goes with what. Um, it wasn't too bad. Everybody loves Congo red, even though it's not red, it's apple green. Um, right, and then what goes with what? Yeah, amyloidosis, right? So anytime that Congo red will pop up, uh, that means there's positive amyloid plaques wherever you're looking at. So that's gonna be your giveaway there. Simulations, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the fusion bile. Yeah, um, kind of looks the same to me, but they'll, hopefully they'll tell you what organ you're in and that'll help to differentiate it. This is iron. Yeah. And then gout, these crystals, needle shaped negatively by bio, refringent is gout, positively by refringent is pseudo gout. And of course, you know, big joint, big toe, that's typically where you get gout. All right, pain management, what is this? Okay. And for the record, I know Dr. Dasso's lectures are long and often complicated. I have always found that his questions on the exam are very fair. And I think the IMCQs and the clicker questions he uses are very represent representative of the kinds of questions he asks. So um, especially when y'all get, get to a respiratory and y'all start doing the chemo regimens where there's like 10 drug combos, like it's very, um, he, 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 he quizzes you on the stuff that he's gonna ask about. A lot of side effect profiles. All right, and we kind of talked about this, the, what you're gonna do. Um, remember that like opioids don't have a ceiling, right? So you, it, you know, which is kind of a problem. Um, that's why they always put uh, acetaminophen typically with an opioid. Uh, because the acetaminophen has a ceiling. So as you can, uh, you can if you take too many um, pills, you can you would overdose on acetaminophen. Technically, you would never overdose on opioids. You would just pass out and have a good time. Um, so that's why they always add acetaminophen to them uh, so that it can help to limit uh, abuse potential. Then breakthrough pain, you always can give some sort of opioid in conjunction. You don't stop the regimen. Say you're giving uh, morphine every eight hours, but at hour six, somebody's giving pain, you can give them like fentanyl or something like that uh, in the hospital. So it's kind of the idea there. 
Yeah, this is that ceiling. So these are fine PCA pumps. <laughs> you could press it like every 10 minutes and it gives you a little dose of medication. For those of you that have had surgery, uh, you're familiar. If you pass out, they don't let your mom click the button for you. You have to cut, you have to click it yourself, just so you know. Uh, um, all right, what else? Comparing. Yeah, and of course, adverse effects, respiratory depression is more as bad too. Mm. All right, so this is more about management than actual um, than actual new new drugs that we, you need to learn. And this kind of bounces off of Dr. Gatos's lecture too. And you can imagine some of these some of these SSRIs do have an analgesic effect because uh, they activate serotonin. If you increase serotonin, uh, you can decrease pain. So that is a thing. See, like these are SNRIs, neuropathic pain. Um, you can give those four. So even anticonvulsants, gabapentin, pregabalin, work with GABA and glutamate. So they will obviously help those work in the central nervous system with um, your nerve with the nerves. So uh, blocking GABA or we're upregulating GABA can help with pain as well. Right. That's an important thing because it's very uh, specific. They use trigeminal neuralgia, if you haven't heard of it. It's like this intractable pain that people get in their face. It's so bad that like, um, like they've done studies and the, there's, there's an increased, like a significant increased risk of suicide for people that have this because the pain is so bad. Um, it's like if wind blows against it, it's like, it's, uh, it's insane. So I'm just telling you that because it's very special. It's hard, very hard to treat. They use carbamazepine for it. Um, but it's one of those things that's like, you, you just don't wanna, you don't wanna see. Um, there's not a lot you can do about it, uh, but they try to get carbamazepine to help with it. Right. Um, yeah, y'all will get into that later. All right, and then the neoplasias, again, like y'all are just getting into, this is all still definition. So this should be, Good for you guys to get some points on this exam. Um, right, so it goes through the theory, right? Of course, the, the profound theory where people think, which makes sense to me at least, is that one cell mutates and then from there you get clonal expansion from there. And downstream from that, there could be additional problems. But the idea is that there's also, there's always one cell of origin that causes it. Um, Right, benign versus malignant. Y'all know this, if it has sarcoma or carcinoma on it, it it's gonna be malignant, right? Versus these uh, adenoma, leomyoma. Just break it down into the Latin derivatives. It may take a couple extra minutes, minutes to work out these Latin derivatives, but you'll never forget them. Like this is smooth muscle, this is skeletal muscle, bone, bone cartilage, you know, um, and that'll help you work out when these get a little more complicated. Right, y'all have learned about this stuff before as well. Okay, yeah. Same stuff. All right, cool. Autochords, what are those? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's the main network. <clears throat> um, Right. So obviously, you know, histamine is released when you get some sort of anaphylaxis. So of course, it causes vasodilation, increased permeability. You start to swell, um, all that stuff. So I think the big thing was like there's differences. Like of course, you, you it, the response isn't necessarily that you're getting histamine to that organ. It's the receptor that's there, right? So that there's H, like it's still histamine that binds to it but it's a different response if it's H1 versus H2 because they're found in different areas of the body. So um, yeah, um, like H1 is in the brain and the nervous system and you'll see H2 uh, dealing with gastric acid. It's like, why does histamine deal with sedation versus, but it also deals with gastric acid secretion? Beats me, but um, yeah. Right, so you go through that. Um, yeah. 
Oh, serotonin. Okay. So yeah, so there's different, you need to know the different serotonin receptors, the drugs that work on each sumatriptan uh, will help to vasoconstrict in the brain. And if you can constrict uh, the vessels in the brain, you can help with migraine pain. Um, so that's how that works. And it's very different because metoclopramide is 5-H4 and that actually works with gastric acid, or I'm sorry, gastric motility. So it can help with gastric motility. Sometimes paper, patients that are just had surgery or um, they're on opioids or whatever, and they're, they're, their gastric motility isn't uh, up to par, you can give metoclopramide and it'll help with that. Um, it's very weird side effect. It has, it's a dopamine antagonist. So like, can't, you can't give this to patients that Parkinson's patient, I'm sorry, um, to patients that you give, uh, schizophrenic patients that you give these medications because um, it can make those extra pyramidal side effects worse, the movement side effects. All right, two is an H1 blocker, a psychohepty. Uh, oh, for like, okay, yeah. So for allergies and stuff. Um, and then, let's see, on Dancitron is Zofran, uh, Antiemetic, it's a great medication um, because it really helps with nausea. Like uh, it's like deep seated, like central nervous system nausea, but it works like it works really well compared to like Finnergan and stuff like that. Um, it's like uh, they use this a lot of times for uh, ch chemotherapy with, uh, with cancer regimens to help with the nausea. And then you have the ergot derivatives. Um, yeah. Bromocryptine again, yeah, that's used for Parkinson's. Oh, it can also decrease prolactin, right? Because remember, dopamine feeds back on prolactin. Mm, prosinoids, yeah, so this goes back into, we talked about this already with the drug, but now we're getting into the leukotrienes, remember? So um, you want to block, we block those, right? Leukotriene receptor blockers will help. Yeah, right, so you wanna block them because they'll cause bronchoconstriction. So you wanna block the leukotrienes to help with, with asthma attacks. And then you have to know these two, like all that, where the prostaglandins, like where, where they, oops, where, what uh, prostaglandin they actually are, um, where they fall under and where, what they work with, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely know those. And then this just goes into the different, you need to know these two, which ones go with which. So you could, if you block the enzyme that makes leukotrienes, obviously you won't get bronchoconstriction and you could also block the receptor, same principle. All right, cool. Where are we at? We're making, <laughs> I don't know if we need to go through all of these. Again, neoplasia two, more about definitions. Um, yeah. Oh God, no, hold on. We do need to look at this because this is where it got a little complicated. You do need to know these actually. They will ask you questions about these. Um, you've seen some of them already. You're gonna see them again and again. So I uh, like HER2, right? Those are estrogen responsive breast cancer, but um, yeah, you're gonna keep getting these again and again. So unfortunately you're gonna have to memorize these and write them all out and stuff. I have a, I have a question on the, that chart you were showing. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the, the crass and the RAS, are they the same or, or is it like the crass leads to like grass? Yeah, I uh, think it's the same. Thing. It's through the same crossway. Like, yeah, I think that's why I wrote that there. Um, okay. uh, I just kept working it, on it and I was confused. I thought like it was a misspelling or something. I think I it's KRAS. I think they call it KRAS because of that. It's the same pathway. Yeah, oh, I'm pretty okay. sure. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then of course, y'all remember you learned about these translocations are gonna be super important, 922 versus 811. Whoops, so they could definitely ask you about that. Then of course, y'all know the hypothesis between tumor formation. Um, obviously you need to commit these to memory too. They can ask you these. Um, no T P53, P super important. It's like 50% of cancers involve that. And then that's definitions. What is this? Oh, where, yeah, 
Mm, right. So this is how PET scans work. They they check for metabolism. So obviously tumors light up if you if you're able to identify metabolism by radio uh, tagging uh, glucose or sugar. The the area of the body that lights up is the one that has high metabolism. And cancers have high metabolism, so they use PET scans to look for like metastasis and stuff. That's pretty interesting. Take advantage of that, the ability to, uh, to check the tumors. But, oh, this is what they use, this form of glucose, which isn't, you can't metabolize it, but it, it lights up so that you could see the areas that are um, highly metabolically active. Oh yeah, definitely know these, um, right? HNPCC, DNA mismatch, microsatellites. Yeah, it has to do with the fact that you can't fix this, these uh, mismatch repair systems down. Um, nucleotide excision repair has to do with xeroderma pigmentosa, right? Those uh, the skin cancers that form. Are these is this the one? I think this is the one that has the thymine dimers, um, or maybe that no, that's maybe a taxidermy. Mm, don't quote me on that. One of those two is the thymine dimers that can't get fixed. Um, yeah. So Bloom syndrome is I think P53. No, that's Leifermini. Bloom syndrome is one of those ones too. Uh, that has a, a lot of, um, whenever you see like P53 involved or like one of the big time tumor players, a lot of times you get like random cancers that don't seem to correlate. You'll get pancreatic cancer plus like eye cancer, plus like a melanoma, right? And it's like, why am I getting all these random tumors? That's because one of the big players in, the, in like, like P53 in that cell cycle is involved. So if you see something like that, um, it kind of correlates to one of those tumor suppressor genes. Oops. Okay, let's see. Yeah, I don't know. Angiogenesis, always important, but knowing uh, the factors VEG, there it is, VEGF, it's gonna be important. If the tumor forms, it's gonna need excess blood supply. So if it needs to do that, it needs to use stuff like uh, um, vascular endothelial growth factors so that I could put extra blood to the tumor. Otherwise, it'll starve. Uh, right, okay. Molecular pathology. Oh God, we're not doing this again. Good luck. Yeah. Go back to the term one stop. There was that chart, that black chart, if y'all remember. Um, and it has all the different, what diseases you use what for. But um, where's Bloom syndrome? It's not there. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I would read through this, but um, don't spend too much time on it. Don't need this one for now. Don't need that one. Oh. All right, so more neoplasia. Right now you're talking about the process of dysplasia where things go haywire and can develop, develop into carcinomas. Right, HPV, super important knowing that they like to test on the different players, like P53 is involved with E6, RB is involved with E7, you knock them both out. Uh, that's a problem, the strains that cause cancer, 16 and 18, that's what the vaccine is for. And then it goes through the different processes, like, uh, like well, this is for endometrial, but you lose P10 first, then KRAS, so it's like a, uh, it's a process to have to form these, um, yeah, these different cancers. Oops. Sometimes it does that. Yeah, same thing here. So just having a general understanding of how these are going to go. So uh, a APC pathway versus the um, the microsatellites. You know, with APC, you're talking about um, adenosine polyposis. Mm, cold, you, know, you know what I mean? Um, versus the H and PCC. So they go through different process, but they get both developed into adenocarcinomas. Adenosine polyposis something like that. Right, remember um, Epstein-Barr virus can lead to like, um, uh, you know, the kissing disease, uh, right? So EBV can develop into Burgess lymphoma or B-cell lymphoma, um, mononucleosis, that's it, yeah. All right. Okay, and of course, um, the problem with H. pylori and those, uh, those um, uh, 
uh, <laughs> the um, you know, in the gas, the, the, the you know what I'm talking about. It could lead to adenocarcinoma. Yeah, uh, Lynn, true. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> All right, bone infections. Nah. Oh, is this where we start getting into? Yeah, so this is like an introduction to all the skin stuff. Yeah, it gets pretty confusing. All right, neoplasia four, and then I'll let Lindsay take over. She could do the skin stuff. Oh, the grading system. Uh, you don't need to know like literally how everything's graded, but you just need to know uh, how like how the grading system works. Like, what's the most important stuff? Um, right. So of course, characterize the tumor. Has it gone? to regional lymph nodes and distant metastasis. Obviously, M is gonna be more important because if that happens, that's a huge problem. Nodal involvement is secondary and then describing the tumor, though it is important, it's the least important of the three. So you don't, know how to, you don't have to know how to stage tumors or stage cancers like that, but just having a general understanding of, of the process that works um, will help you out. Oh, these are super important too. Perineoplastic syndromes. You need to be able to understand what goes with what. So, hmm, I they those are really better. big later. So just know what they are and that they exist right now. Yeah. Well, yeah, but in the specifically, they'll talk about like parathyroid hormone, or it looks like PTH, and it's secreted from these squamous cell carcinomas of the lung. So um, that's a good example of one, um, like the patient will come in with hypercalcemia and you'll be like, I don't see, I don't know why, like they're, um, it doesn't seem like there's any problem with their parathyroids, their calcium levels are fine. Come to find out it's being secreted from this tumor in the lung, which you wouldn't expect. So that's a perineoplastic syndrome. So the tumor is secreting or something is secreting something else that's giving uh, another, um, another uh, pathology. Oh, here's the other one. Small cell lung cancer can secrete ACTH, right? So you can get Cushionoid type syndrome uh, symptoms. It, small cell does other things than just ACTH, but um, yeah, that's I guess that's all you need to know for now. But definitely be aware that they'll they'll tell you the patient comes in and they'll give you the labs. They'll be like their calcium's through the roof, um, you know, and uh, you don't you can't figure out why and come to, come to find out it's a squamous cell carcinoma. So that's, that's important to know. Yeah, definitely know these two, these different markers that go with uh, different cancers because that's how you can identify them. These as well. Actually, this is probably one of the most important things for your life because uh, these are gonna be how you diagnose cancers. These are tumor markers. Right, so the different cancers that can develop uh, there. And right, um, all right, hey, Lindsay, if you wanna cover the skin stuff, I can do the heme stuff when you're done. How's that sound? Sounds good. All right, are you a host? Can you take the screen over? Yeah, I can. Oh. And Did if y'all have any- Your screen or do you want me to pull it up on mine? You could pull it up on yours. Otherwise, okay. I can't use my computer. computer. Yeah, that's fine. Um, You're fine. And if y'all have any questions, y'all could just ask and we could all figure it out together. Yeah. I will say, I'm going to do my best walking you guys through the SMB, but I will say that um, the questions were very intense. I think Brady will confirm that. <laughs> Confirmed. <laughs> Thank you, Brady. Let me pull it up.
Sorry, I'm trying to pull them all up so I don't have to go back and forth for you guys. But I found them. Wow, there are a lot of SMB lectures. Okay. Come on. There we go. Okay, so this is just your overview. It's just an intro. So defining different characteristics, and of course, this will kind of take you into everything else so talking about the microbiome we don't really have to go through that um, just examples infections by body site special questions hey lindsay yeah. can you can you zoom in on the screen it might be a little easier yeah. for them to see yeah this lecture the dla i don't even think I paid attention to it very much, quite honestly, because it was such an overview and all of this stuff is expanded upon in the lectures. And so I'm not even going to spend any time on that. So we're just going to start with SMB1. So you'll notice that Dr. Rayner is very organized in how she goes through her stuff. And so I, you, you guys know I love chunking material and I would do that. So when it says tinnias, dermatophytic, fungi, group that together, um, just go through and make sure you're chunking everything um, like with like. So this is a chart that she provided for you. She does have a PDF of it. I would print it out. I found it helpful. Yes, the small differences are gonna make a difference, especially when you get to the ones that are very similar with one another. Okay, this is just intro. This is also intro, intro stuff. Okay, now getting into the good stuff. So, Butania, she always starts out with a clinical picture. Pay attention to these pictures. Um, they like to put pictures on the exam with in reference to specific identifying features of a pathology of a microbe. Um, it's much easier than in year one, which was a lot of identification. This is more, it helps you um, pinpoint what you're looking at. And so if you can remember, okay, this is what this is, it can easily get you to the diagnosis before you even get through the vignette. Um, and so, uh, familiarize yourself with this. This is something that I didn't do as much of in FTCM and I regretted it. So key questions. Um, this is duration. Is it itchy elsewhere on the body systemic systems? This is fever, chill, stuff like that. History of bites or pet contact. This is really big because they love, love, love reservoirs and um, modes of transmission. Physical exam, annular lesions. Pay attention to this. This is what they are going to use in the vignette to tell you what you're looking looking at. So they'll tell you a patient comes in with a certain presentation, physical exam shows annular lesions with a central resolution. This is how you are going to pinpoint what you are looking at. So anytime it gives you um, symptoms or an exam, just know that that's what's going to show up in the vignette. So tinea ringworm says gradually enlarging O-shaped. This is one of those um, buzzwords o-shaped uh raised scaly this is important because when you talk about different rashes when you talk about different region lesions the description of those lesions is very 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 important so raised scaly borders is a very indicative thing of this lesion of this tinea wingworm le lesion then slowly expanding peripherally um, with a clear center 
Um, so this, again, this is all just describing your presentation. So make sure you understand that. I wouldn't expect them to put um, this picture on the exam, just describing it, but they could put this picture on the exam. So this is uh, just sites, tinea is just referring to the infection, capitis corporis, pedis curis is just the location. So um, that's really what it's talking about. So not causal agents, it's really just telling you where it is on the body. Dermatophytic skin, derm, skin. So dermatophytic fungi. So these are all of the fungi that are going to affect the skin. Um, so trichophyton rubrum, yes, please, 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 please know the description of them. So know the disease or the causative agent or the description of the causative agent because they love, love, love to give you the presentation and then ask you which of the following is um, um, a factor of the causative agent or something along those lines. Um, metabolize keratin, so they have keratinases hyphae that slowly goes outward. Um, now it's moving on. So microsporum is giving you a bunch of different ones on there. Direct contact, highlight that. Mode of transmission, anytime I say mode of transmission, that's very important. Warm, damp conditions, that can be an indicator. Um, not the most high yield there, but it can be an indicator if it talks about a region um, that a patient is living. Um, so contaminated soil, zoophilic, anything in pink you want to really pay attention to, they like to highlight that. So you can get it through a direct con contact fomites, um, highly transmiss transmissible. So again, this is all just um, under that grouping, just put it under that chunking of the dermatophytic fungi. So they love to talk about their pathogenesis, so establishing the infection. So you get the exposure, talk about that attachment, utilization, prote uh, proteinases, keratinases, that's kind of moderately high yield right there. Um, response to metabolic byproduct influence, okay. Okay, so that just went over the dramatic phytic fungi. Versa color. This one hopefully is a little easier because um, tinea versa color. This condition is going to um, be very characteristic of the hypo um, and hyperpigmented lesions. And so, when you can get an easy one, quote unquote easy one like that, due to the name, um, cherish that. Um, but they will probably will, they will probably describe it as a hypo or hyperpig. Pig, uh, pigmented lesions, um, seborrheic area, so trunk, back, proximal limbs, plaques, fine scales, well demarcated. This is very important um, that these plaques are very well demarcated. Itchy versus non-itchy, that's a distinguishing factor. Um, so this is another one within that group, malassezia. Um, again, anything in pink, pay attention to. They love that. So Tinea nigra, brown to black. So that's a keyword there. Um, palms and soles, if it specifies a location, that's going to help you. A lot of this stuff you really just got to write out. Um, again, like I said, they love the pink because um, they're highlighting it for you. Let's see if I can pick out some. Oh, anytime they talk about a diagnosis. So this is coral red under UV. I specifically remember this term, coral red under UV. So this is a buzzword. So associate this with, associate coral red under UV with Carinobacterium uniticinum. So that causes erab, um, erythrasma. Erythrasma. Um, gram positive bacillus, something that they love to do. I already said this, but 
describe a condition, then say what is a um, condition of the causative agent, and they'll put gram positive bacillus, gram positive, gram positive cocci. Um, so you know that tropics. That's going to be something that you can identify in the vignette. It's never something that I really, really focused on, but it can help you um, for location. Um, again, all of this, it's going along the same lines. I don't have to go through all of these individual slides. Um, species, remember they're highlighting things in pink, focus on the pink. Um, the, when they go through the life cycles here, these will get important. Um, I don't remember them being too important SMB, but what you wanna look for is the diagnostic and the infectious stage. And so if they specify a diagnostic and infectious stage, you need to highlight it and you need to remember it because it is very testable. It is very high yield. Um, but for the most part, so this says, um, so eggs and feces, rubidiform larvae hatches, develops. So this doesn't actually specify what is the infectious versus the um, uh, whatever form, but that is very important. You need to understand that. But anything else on these diagrams, you can pretty much just look at once, understand it, but commit to memory those high yield points. Um, again, this is all kind of the same thing I was talking about. Again, um, they might use these pictures. This is a black escar, again, high yield points um so you're talking about anthrax i don't have to go through this you can read the slides um but it's um virulence factors they love 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 virulence factors so if anything can help a um an organism be more effective then they are going to focus on that i can bet you that um, so again, this is just going through this same thing. Oh, this, I remember this lecture spending a lot of time on this specific, specific lecture. So SMB infections too, because they go through this and there's a big difference um, in the cases. Uh, oh, so impetigo, scalded skin syndrome, shock syndrome, bullous impetigo. I spent a really long time on this um, because the slides are a little out of order or they were when we did it out of order in the sense that in how I like to organize my information. So I spent a really long time on this lecture organizing it, how it made sense to me. But you do need to go through and um, understand the different conditions and it says toxin mediated. So each of these is going to have a different pathogenesis based on the toxin. Um, so again, this is just presentation, how you're going to recognize it in the stem. Um, scalded sin, toxic, toxic shock, bullous and vertigo. So these are the three big ideas of this lecture. So if I'm chunking this information, I see this slide and I say, okay, these are the three main things that they want me to understand. I put them at the you know top of my chart, top of my list, and then I organize the slides based off of that. So um, again, this is all just how they're gonna say it in the stem, how they're gonna say it in the stem. That's again, um, know all of these facts, gram positive cocci, grape like non modal catalase positive, that it's going to help you uh, differentiate between other organisms. Um, exotoxin versus endotoxin, understand that. I'm trying to figure out where the, okay, here we go. So the target for scalded shock is desmoglion one. That's big. Um, so this is it. This is the super antigen toxin. So if if I'm chunking all this together, this is the big point under super antigen toxin. Um, after I understand how they're going to represent it in the stem for me to under to understand what I'm looking at, um, and then you know then teratoxin A. 
leading to an overwhelming T cell response and cytokine release, and then you get inflammation and a bunch of other stuff. So fever, shock, drop in blood pressure, so all the systemic symptoms. Um, and then um, that's just the, yeah. So nothing too complicated here. Again, just chunk it, organize it the best way. Um, this is epidemiology. I never, the epidemiology will help you a lot when you get to rashes because the rashes are so similar. It might differ in just one point in the stem. So, but this stuff, I don't know if I paid all that much attention to not, um, not gonna lie to you, but um, so all of this is talking about SRAS. That is the common factor in all of these. Um, community acquired versus hospital acquired, um, going through that. So this is basically just along the same lines, the same theme, how it's going to present to you in the stem. Yeah, I don't think I need to read this to you. I don't think I need to go specifically through um, because it, she organizes her slides very well. But do pay attention to the pictures she puts on these. Again, it's not as quote unquote bad as it was in year one. It, it's very helpful actually, because you can look at it and it'll help you narrow down your diagnosis very quickly. Oh, and with histo, somebody asked earlier in the chat how big they are in histo. Again, simply with respect to big identifiable things for different um, uh, organisms. So it's actually quite helpful in year two. Okay, again, this is all on the same lines. I don't need to go over that with you. Yeah, the biggest thing I can say about the SMB stuff is put them all side by side, look at the differences between all of them, see the age, the chronicity, the presentation, and be able to distinguish between them because that's going to be your saving grace when you get to the exam um, and you are trying and you are going through the clinical presentations and the vignettes to see where you're going, but it's always going to be the vignette and then it's going to ask you something about the causative agent. So virulence factor, what the causative agent is, a description of the causative agent, so virus versus DNA and what type of virus, what type of DNA, um, that sort of thing. And they might ask you um, the histologic features, but it's gonna be the big histologic features that are characteristic for that thing. You guys went over coag and catalase tests earlier and the difference between staph and strep. I'm not gonna go through that. I remember these picture, one of these pictures being on the exam very vividly. Yeah, it's kind of spelled out for you, quite honestly, how they're gonna show it to you. Um, so raw meat, this is one of those things. Um, what are the risk factors? So handling raw meat is gonna be uh, is an example of that. Yeah, um, paronchia, this is just um, at the nail bed. Simple one, actinomycosis. Yeah, if you like whiteboard like me, whiteboard it out. If you like to draw your notes out, do it, um, do that. But all of the SMB lectures pretty much, they follow this format. I don't have to read them at you. Do you guys have any 
specific. I haven't been looking at the chat. Do you guys have any specific questions? I, I don't I don't want to like insult your intelligence by like reading these at you because it really does follow the exact same format going through every single one of these SMB infections. It gives you the presentation, it gives you the causative agent, the um, characteristics of the causative agent, and then, um, oh, this is a nice little summary table. Any pictures with very distinctive, again, I think I'm repeating myself there, but any distinctive histo, any distinctive um, pictures of a physical exam finding are going to help very much. Um, but something to pay attention to as well, if there is a specific risk factor, let's say, you know, a farmer or somebody working in the slaughterhouse or somebody went hunting or something along those lines. And so um, the occupational history, the lifestyle history, it will be a very good thing to help you through that. Okay, this is where it gets very, very, um, not confusing because it's not confusing, but the presentations are quite similar because there are a bunch of rashes. And so the differences between all of these. So I would call this a very high yield lecture. So this is SMB5. I would call this a very high yield lecture in that a lot of questions will come from here and the distinguishing factors will be few. So make sure you understand each individual presentation. Um, so the biggest thing is the type of rash. So pustular versus MACPAC versus, um, you know, if, if it can be MACPAC or vesicular. So first distinguish between these two. This will be very indicative in your question stem on the type. And then, you know, it narrows it down. And of course, you have the different presentations. Um, you need to notice the vaccination status because that will pull you in on if it can be something or not. So for example, um, you know, most children in the United States are uh, vaccinated against, uh, you know, MMR, so measles, mumps, rubella. So if you have a vaccinated child, you would kind of steer away from those things versus if they're unvaccinated, then that's a red flag. Oh, hey, I should probably look at these things because it could very well be that. Um, notice where this rash appears. So first on the abdomen and then it spreads everywhere else. So the, that is the development of the disease. So multiple stages at all the same time as very high yield point. So you have macules and papules and vesicles and pustules and crusts. So um, it's just a whole hodge, hodgepodge of things. Again, we're talking about kids here. So varicella, this is still under the um, chicken pox um, umbrella. Do drop on rose petal, it's going to be a characteristic that you will probably be able to see in the stem to tell you what it is. Um, reactivation of virus shingles. BZV still under that umbrella. Double strand DNA again, they love that stuff. Love, 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 love that stuff. So HSV1 versus HSV2. It's so funny. We were tested over so many of these things today. Okay, now going on to the Mac Pap rashes. Again, small child. Um, pay attention to the physical exam. Again, no history of childhood vaccinations. Noticing the 
specific ones. It starts on the hairline, sides of the deck behind the ears, and spreads to the trunk, including palms and soles. All of these are words that, yes, you do need to memorize because they will help you distinguish between them. Oh, and um, this was also a big thing. I do remember this slide being high yield in understanding the presentation of the disease um, with respect to the different phases. So do look at this and understand because that um, it can say, it means that the disease can present differently at different times. That's it. But hey, can you go back up to that last one? This one? I, yeah, the one right before with the graph. Uh, yeah, this. They, I remember them writing questions saying like the fever started and then on like day four, they developed a rash and the rash went away before the fever stopped. Right, so that, that'll differentiate it from other ones where the rash starts first before the fever. So not only knowing the rash, the distribution of the rash and, how, rash and how it progresses, like it went from trunk to arms or it went from face to neck to palms or whatever, not only knowing that, but knowing um, like what happens first, like it's only, it's only a three day rash, right? And it's a 10 day fever. So knowing those will help you differentiate it on the exam because a lot of these are really close together. Yeah, very close together. That's just epidemiology. Um, I'm trying to figure out some good high yield stuff for you guys. Oh, the different HHVs, that's one says six. I don't know if they test you on the different ones, but just make sure you understand the different ones or that there are different ones and what their presentation is. Um, but this goes on to the next one, I believe. Yes, it does. Um, like Brady said, like I said, rash on palms and soles. Um, understand the location of the rashes, the progression of the rashes, where it starts, where it ends up. Um, some kind of move from place to place to place. So generalized MACPAP rash non-coalescing, um, pay attention if they do have systemic symptoms, so fever, headache, chills, all that fun stuff. Again, another fun graph like this, knowing um, how all the symptoms relate to one another. So this one's you have lymphadenopathy pretty much throughout the entire disease. Um, you have a rash right before you get the fever and the fever will persist. Always know the family. Transmitted aerosol droplets, they love transmission, like I said. Oh, big one. Um, and I love this because this confirms I got this right on the exam today. <laughs> um, but congenital rubella, you get um, the, this classic triad. <laughs> we'll be covered more in congenital <laughs> infections than I. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. That was our exam today. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, I feel like I was just slapping the face all with that. Um, rubella, measles. Oh, I do remember them distinguishing the difference between German measles and measles. So rubella and rub um, rubiola. So know the difference between, so this has no coplic, spots, no spotophobia, no happy hacking cough, whereas measles does. Slap cheek, I remember this very well. Parvovirus B19, highlight this on your slide. Um, 
common in school children. Um, they say common in school children in places where there are um, large populations, like daycare, military, college campuses, pay attention to that because that will be something that they use in their STEM and it can narrow down your differentials very quickly. Um, receptor P um, antigen, again, a virulence factor, I love it. Um, notice if something is bad in pregnancy, a lot of these do have teratogenic effects and will cause congenital defects. Again, another awesome graph telling you the symptom progression throughout the disease. My God, I'm seeing so many things that were on our exam. Again, same thing, family description, description of symptoms, all of this stuff. So this is the pathogenesis. Okay. Um, know the different ones, if they specify different conditions with different ones. Um, so if it, for example, if they specified something for Coxsackie A versus Coxsackie B, know the difference between the two of those. So that, speaking of Coxsackie A, um, it's going again, pretty much um, not frequently associated with malignant carcinoma. We already mentioned this before, whenever something it gives you a high risk of something else, it will nine times out of 10 be tested. Hint, hint, wink, wink. Um, they love, 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 love association. So if they say increased risk for, or a complication of, you can pretty much guarantee you're going to be tested on it. Yeah, more good buzzwords, more good distinguishing pictures. Um, so this is important. It's a painless purplish cutaneous lesion, percoposis. Um, so like I said, if they specify a different um, serotype, you need to, to pay attention to that. So this is HHV8. So HHV8 is associated with the Kaposi sarcoma. Um, I don't remember in SMB lab tests being a huge thing. Really don't. But the agent, the symptoms, if they have a vaccine, so live attenuated versus not, that is definitely something to pay attention to. Oh, and that's the end of SMB. Want to take it back, Brady? Sure, we can quickly go through. Okay, so everyone, I just uploaded all my lecture notes to the Google Drive. So if you want to go look at that and see um, what I highlighted, what we've just been looking at were my note, well, for my stuff was my notes, um, obviously. <laughs> um, so y'all could go if y'all want to look and see that. That's fine. Okay, so quickly, um, hemodynamics. So, well, we talked about this a lot in renal, right? So when we, it's again, a good bit of review. Y'all remember all this stuff. I don't know if I could even ask you some of this basic stuff of um, differentiating. It used to be three fourths. Now it's four fifths, apparently. I don't know. I learned it as three and one fourth, three fourths and one fourth, but whatever. Okay. Um, so I, we talk about edema. Remember, hydrostatic pressure pushes, pushes out, oncotic pressure pulls it back in. So the big thing they talk about if you have liver failure, the reason you get ascites is because you're not making protein, uh, you're not making albumin. Albumin stays in the vessels. So it helps with that pro 
plasma oncotic pressure. Oncotic pressure is the same thing as colloid osmotic pressure. That's the same thing. So this oncotic pressure holds fluid in. If you don't have stuff like albumin, these big proteins, you can't hold the fluid in the vessels, you get ascites. That's why those kids that are protein malnourished get quashiorcores because they don't have, uh, they don't make protein, they don't make albumin. So they have no plasma oncotic pressure, the hydrostatic pressure overrules and they get a lot of fluid buildup, okay? So that's one of those things with uh, hydrostatic pressure. And depending on the pathology, um, you can kind of dictate what's causing the edema, right? Edema can be a CHS problem, it could be a sodium problem. Uh, it completely depends on the situation, right? So knowing that will help you get through some of this other stuff. I like how they did it in clinical case format. It's kind of like a question. It outlines a little scenario for you. So yeah, but this all goes through the idea of, um, of going through this oncotic versus hydrostatic pressure. My advice would be to don't go on to um, these hemody the hemodynamic lecture two until you understand this one, right? Make sure you understand the whole idea of this. Um, and then vasogenic edema is actually is vascular. We actually did this. This looks very familiar to a slide we had for our test. Uh, vasogenic edema is um, caused by the vessels. Extracellular cytotoxic is obviously intracellular cell death. So that's come some of the reasons that could be caused, causing that are here. Um, obviously, if you give hypoxia or ischemia to the cell, the, si this, to the cells will die. You get this intracellular rupture or intracellular base edema. Right. Um, we actually had this on our exam too. Uh, right, so the different herniations, subfalcine here, uh, tonsillar herniation here, uh, here, right here through the Fermi magnum. So this will pinch um, the, uh, the upper aspect of the brainstem and you can get, uh, you lose consciousness, you have problems with respiration. You also have the transtentoral one, this was on our exam actually, um, where this guy had an epidural hematoma, uh, this herniated through and he had uh, one blown eye, right? He had uh, one eye was blown because you're compressing on the parasympathetics here of oculomotor nerve three, if y'all remember from neuro. So it's good for y'all to know these two and the symptomology that can happen with any of these brain insults. All right, short and sweet. Let's see, what are we doing here? Hemorrhage shock. Okay, great. So again, a good bit of review, just kind of elaborating on some of the other, uh, uh, on stuff you've learned in the past. Hyperemia just means increased blood there um, in that area um, that you can develop. So if you have some sort of injury there, you get hyperemia to the, to the area, just increased blood there. Um, right, and then you talk about venous congestion as well. If you primarily you talk about this in the liver, um, uh, when you get these heart failure cells actually develop in the liver um, because if you get backflow from the right heart into the liver, um, you end up getting portal hypertension and you get this congestion. Remember, we talked about this, the area, the area one that's closest to oxygen in blood gets the toxic uh, um, toxins first, so they'll die from toxins. Whereas as you progress, zone three, you'll die from ischemia just because uh, you use oxygen as you go along. So this area is prone to toxin damage. Zone three, closer to the portal or the central vein uh, is prone to ischemia. And then hemorrhage, right? Different types of hemorrhage. These are, this is what the TKA is, these little red spots. Uh, usually this has to do with thrombocytopenia. If you, if you, if you don't have thrombin um, to make, uh, proper clots, you get these little micro injuries and then you get these little blood, this little blood formation, right? So these are little blood clots, not clots, but little blood uh, aggregates there. That's what petechiae is. You can see that's due to thrombocytopenia because you don't have, um, uh, you don't have platelets to help with uh, clotting that off on a very a mi microscopic level in microvasculature. Again, okay, so DIC, whenever you think of DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, you're thinking like you're on the verge of going through such shock. Like your, your, the, your blood uh, is getting to a point where things are just starting to clot. Uh, little clots are forming in the vasculature because there's so much going on. Uh, there's inflammatory cells going. Uh, maybe you're going through some sort of hypovolemic shock or something like that. So um, you wanna watch out for that. Anytime that's always a red flag for um, how, you know, big problems coming. Uh, coming on. So um, it happens in a lot of different situations, uh, but that's usually what it means. 
right? And it kind of goes through to see like, these are very different situations, but they all kind of mean like, they're like an oh shit situation, right? And right, so these are precursors or acute inflammatory responses to that. Um, yeah. And then it kind of goes through the different ideas of shock. Y'all touched on this, I guess, in cardio, but this goes into the, the different types of shock. So it's important to know the different ones. They kind of make sense. Cardiogenic is if your heart fails. Hypovolemic, you don't have a little, enough volume there. Septic, usually due to some sort of um, microbial response to it. So, um, and you get those, these toxins related to all of the, the infections going through and you can go to septic shock. Pretty much all of them lead to hypovolemia because you get massive vasodilation, but they have different causes there. Neurogenic anaphylaxis as well with that histamine release. Um, right, and the stages of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is good to go through. This is stuff that's gonna have real life situations that that's gonna go. Um, yeah, but again, it's kind of good. They give you these little situations. These, they'll tell you all the important stuff you need to know in the clinical scenario. Two, skin, muscle, and bone. How oh, you do that good. All right, what's this about? Let's check, check our roadmap. Mm, septic shock, right? Okay, so same thing, right? They'll give you a little scenario. Uh, some sort of um, bacterial infection went haywire, got into the bloodstream. It's you no know, problem. Of course, if it's in the bloodstream, you can get DIC, these little clots that form all over. Um, uh, right, you can lead to toxic shock syndrome, depending on the causality and super antigen formation as well. And things that kind of go together, thrombosis, DIC, increased vascular permeability. Uh, these will all lead to a pro-coagulant state, right? So any of these, well, DIC is coagulation in and of itself, but it's gonna just be um, exacerbated from uh, there on. Right, so some of the major players here, um, again, I, like I said, I posted this stuff. So if y'all wanna go see all this stuff, like the red stuff is super important to me. Um, and like, like of the clinical features, like the yellow things would be like, well, you can kind of see that in a lot of different things. I don't know that I'm super important. I'd call those super important. Green's kind of like, okay, um, that's something to take note of, but by all means for the exam, you want to be able to differentiate septic shock. So that's kind of my rationale when I, when I highlight these things. Um, and then it's still septic shock, coagulation band necrosis, um, that can happen. So that's, that would be like a good, uh, buzzword to know that that correlates to that. Some of the areas, the hippocampus is always uh, in danger um, with ischemia, right? Not, I wouldn't consider it a watershed area, but it, it's still that the, these are these uh, neur neurons are very susceptible to injuries in those situations. Then thrombosis, y'all know about that. We're forming some sort of clot, um, not an emboli. It's not traveling. It's just forming where it is. It's of course, if it, if it um, <coughs> ruptures, it could lead to um, and emboli. These are super important. You have to know all three of these. These lead to thrombosis. So some sort of injury, some, something that's going to tell the platelets, okay, we're going to, uh, we want to coagulate, right? Abnormal blood flow will stop, the, stop all the factors from getting there. And any sort of hypercoagulable state, whether it's genetic or whatnot, or it's some sort of septic shock or whatever, is going to lead to this abnormal thrombosis that's going to form. Whether that lead to DIC later on or whatnot um, is to be seen. Um, Right, so turbulent flow, of course, uh, this would uh, be prone to forming uh, clots. Trisosan. Oh, from the necrotic cell, okay. Um, yeah, and then some of the hereditary causes, this is lead to hypercoagulability. Dr. Pavladin, these, these patients that have this deficiency, they're prone to, to clotting. Uh, Antithrombin three, that's where heparin works. If it's, uh, you can't do that, then, um, prone to clotting and these deficiencies, these are anticoagulants as well. All right, so again, and then the last one, what are you doing? All right, we can go into emboli, right? So these different, first the different types of, this is important, um, they ask about this, this lines of zon uh, indicates a, th uh, a thrombus, right? So um, if, there, if there's a clot that forms, 
platelets are not involved. But if it's a thrombus, the platelets have to be involved. If the platelets are involved, you're going to get these lines of Zod. Okay, so they do ask about that um, in regards to platelet, platelet uh, aggregation. Right, so this is the idea. The thrombus forms, forms a clot there. Hopefully it breaks up. If it dislodges, uh, you're probably, you know, you're looking at a PE or something like that, or um, a DVT, uh, right? Depending on where it is, venous, um, it, get, it gets lodged in the legs and stuff like that. And then arterial thrombi uh, usually tend to come from the heart, stuff like atrial fibrillation when the heart's shaking like that, that's that turbulent flow and you could form a clot and it shoots through the system, All right? You can get an MI and stuff like that. Here's more Trousseau sign. Thrombophlebitis, so inflammation and clotting formation in the vessel. Um, and it could be uh, a sign of an abnormal malignancy. I can't remember that coming up, but at some point, I guess I was listening to the lecture and I felt like they kept harping on that. And then of course, right, emboli, very bad. I don't want that to happen. Gets to the lungs, if it's big enough, you get a saddle embolus that could lead to um, instant death. All right. Remember, sometimes with patients that have um, some sort of BSD or some sort of shunt, uh, right to left shunt, you can get a clot formation, a venous clot, and it gets through the hole in the heart and goes arterially, and it can go straight to the brain, right? That's a paradoxical clot. I'm not sure they should talk about that at some point, but um, that's always a risk factor. Because um, if, if it's in the venous system, it gets lodged in the leg, like, yeah, that's bad, but it's, it's, very, it's much worse if it gets through the heart to the arterial side and gets stuck in the brain, right? Okay. And then of course it goes to the different ones. Uh, make note of this picture. This is a saddle embolus. Look how large that is. You cannot breathe. You cannot get airflow into your lung if you have a big old clot, uh, saddle clot right there. And you can, this leads to instant death, right? Here's the paradoxical, right? So venous circulation goes through the heart from the right ventricle to, to the left ventricle, for instance, uh, systemic system uh, right to the brain. Um, so that's always a problem for some sort of stroke. Again, they give you a nice um, clinical case. Fat emboli, uh, you're always thinking of um, um, a fracture. They always talk about this in regards to a fracture. So if somebody comes in and they broke their femur, these flat fat globules, which you wouldn't necessarily think there's like fat in the bone, but there is. And there's like these big fat emboli that form. Um, and then, so usually the questions I've seen about this uh, correlate to um, some sort of uh, serious bony fracture, bone marrow embolus. Yeah, so there's fat in there. Air emboli, childbirth um, is classic for that. Um, sometimes if the you know, when they give IV medications, uh, you have to, um, I forget what they call it, but you have to get the air out of the line before you start uh, pumping the medication in because you don't want to put an air bubble in. Scuba diving, you're talking about the bins, um, nitrogen. Uh, toxicity, that's why you have to do safety stops and stuff, because um, you don't want the nitrogen to come out of the tissue into the, the vasculature and cause these emboli. The amniotic fluid obviously is from um, pregnancy. Uh, I like this picture. I think this was one that they like to use. Um, so that's indicative of an amniotic fluid embolism. Then atherosclerosis, of course, if that breaks off, that's a problem as well. Um, renal artery, yeah, even the heart, right? Um, and then just some other ones. Let's see, this looks, CKMB and troponin, guy had a heart attack, right? Yep, occlusion. White infarcts pale, right? Little bleeding, of course, if it's pale, there's no blood, little bleeding. Uh, so solid organs that don't have those anastomoses, uh, kidney, spleen, kidney, spleen, heart, um, like that spleen picture we saw earlier. Uh, arterial occlusion, which is this red infarcts, venous infarction. So you get uh, congestion followed by, so like um, a lot of the backflow um, uh, is that like, so there'll be a lot of blood there and then you get the infarction. So that's why it tends to have excess blood in the area. So you can differentiate them uh, by, by looking at that. So you can see that here, this wedge shape right here, infarct. Um, so this would be an example of coagulation necrosis. All right, so again, dual blood supply, you would expect more blood, it would be a bread infarct versus 
um, some of the areas like the heart, for instance, has those white infarcts. They don't have a lot of collateral blood supply, right? And um, as always, the time frames are important for MIs and cerebral infarctions too, especially in pathology, right? We want to know what's going on. 12 hours starting it, um, 48 hours, it's getting worse. Um, you're starting to get these uh, um, macrophages in the brain to um, work harder or try to take away the debris. And then you start uh, weeks later, you get this liquefactor necrosis. Right. And you can see that here, the over time. Yeah, you can kind of see it there. Uh, over time, it gets really bad. And you can see this white, see this is the heart, you see it's white, right? There's not a lot of collateral blood supply. This is, this is likely arterial. So that's why it has this white coagulation necrosis. All right, that is all we have. Um, I know it was long, I know people had to go. Um, if y'all have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out. Obviously, ideally we would have had stuff put together for y'all, but um, we, we had our exam. Wow. <laughs> so I, we, we, we know y'all understand. We did, you know, we yeah. just uh, wanted to, you know, make sure we did this for you guys. So if I yeah. uh, have any more questions, uh, if not, you're free to go. I'll go ahead and stop the recording. If y'all need anything, just reach out. Uh, good luck on your exam. I'm sure y'all would be great.